Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, applied uh, IoT tutorial at uh, KDD. So thank you very much for being here at eight in the morning on Sunday. So in this tutorial, uh, we are going to talk about uh, applied uh, IoT. So first, we'll give an introduction of Internet of Things uh, analytics, and then after that, we look at uh, three case studies. So we look at uh, privacy and security, but we look also at uh, uh, predictive maintenance and uh, online networks. Okay, so yeah, my name is uh, Albert Buffet. I'm associate professor at uh, Company Tech and also honorary research associate at the Weka Machine Learning Group at uh, University of Waikato in New Zealand. Uh, with me will be uh, Latif Furkan, he's a full professor at the uh, Computer Science Department at the Texas University at Dallas. And uh, we have also João Gama, he's an associate professor at the University of Porto. And finally, Wei Fan, that he's the head of uh, Baidu Research Big Data Lab uh, in, uh, in California. Okay, so the outline of the tutorial is going to be the following. So we divided the tutorial in four parts. So in the first part, we are going to talk about the IoT fundamentals, introduction, and we'll look at the, at the machine learning part, so how we do that, uh, how we can do analytics on IoT. So we we'll look at uh, predictive learning, descriptive learning, frequent pattern mining, and also evolving uh, analytics uh, when we include the novel patterns. The second part will go through social network analysis. We'll look at what are the challenges. We'll look at uh, how to do online sampling. Uh, we'll look at evolving centralities and communities. And finally, how to track the dynamics of these evolving communities. Then we'll go to uh, predictive maintenance. So we'll look how we can apply, uh, uh, we'll look at a study case on predictive maintenance, or how we can apply these analytic methods to, to perform this task. We'll look at the Problem definition, then we look at, uh, uh, at um, anomaly and outlier detection. And we look also at uh, how to detect the failure prediction and detection. And finally, we'll have uh, this also case study about uh, security on data stream mining. So we look also at the different types of attacks, uh, how we can secure data and system logs, how we can defend against side channel effects, data obliviousness, and randomization. So we have set this uh, website, so we'll put the slides on this uh, website, so you will have this website, uh, these uh, slides there. So we're going to have a break at 10, so from 10 to 10.30 is going to be the coffee break. So this is the, the plan for, for this tutorial. Okay, so let's start. So let's start with the fundamentals, so let me first uh, start uh, introducing the Internet of Things setting. So I think that really the Internet of Things is something that is going to be really, really big in the next uh, five years. So if we look at uh, the predictions, uh, there are several predictions that Gartner that is predicting that we'll have around 20 billion IoT devices by 2020. But uh, there are other predictions. ADC is uh, predicting that we are going to have around 32 billion of IoT devices. So this is really, really a huge uh, quantity of, of devices that are going to be connected and that they are going to be providing a lot, a lot of data. So how to mine this data, how to do analysis on this data is going to be something really, really important. So there are many applications. So we have, for example, in energy management, uh, we have these smart meters that they <coughs> compute what is the consumption of uh, electricity in all the houses. So for example, in France, EDF wants to put one of these uh, smart meters in all the houses and then uh, they will be interested in not only doing aggregation of this data but also doing disaggregation of this data. So we have the total consumption inside the house and then we would like to do prediction of how this uh, data is, uh, yeah, how this data is disaggregated from the different machines that uh, we have inside the house. No? The TV, the television, the washing machine, heater, all of these. Uh,
Okay, other applications is, of course, a smart, uh, <coughs> smart homes. We have all these new devices from Amazon, Google, that are very nice, and they are going to be connecting all the uh, devices inside the house through the Internet of Things. We have a smart cities. We have all of these sensors and actuators that we can use. It could be for parking, or it could be also for electricity to, to optimize what is the consumption of electricity inside the city. So, for example, we have the sensor. If there's nobody, the lights can be turned off. If there's somebody, the lights can be turned off. And then how we optimize what is the traffic and the management of all the cars inside the, inside the city. Finally, we have uh, what, everything that is related to industry. So we have uh, all of these uh, machines that are going to be inside the factories and we would like to have all of this information that is running there. So as we see, there are many, many applications. So if we look at the uh, projects that uh, the companies are spending money, basically we see that are based on connected industries, smart cities, smart energy, uh, autonomous car, of course. And then uh, we have other options as uh, smart agriculture, uh, health, smart retailers. So there are many, many different applications of, of Internet of Things. One of the important ones is industry. So there's this idea of Industry 4.0 that comes from the German government. So the idea here is that what we would like is to have a virtual copy of what is happening inside the factory. So we have all the data. And then this will allow us to, to make better decisions. So many decisions will be, able, will be automated, but many decisions will be someone who is going to be uh, deciding them. But the idea is to have something that is uh, really a virtual copy of what is happening. And the final goal should be to, to have a really, uh, a really automated industry where uh, there is no need of uh, any human. OK, so only to see how the predictions of the Internet of Things, how it's growing. So in 2013, we had only 2% of the data of all the digital universe. This is a study of EMC digital universe. So we were supposing that we had only 2%. And around 2020, we are going to have 12% of all the data in the world is going to be uh, on the Internet of Things. Also, if we look at the popularity, so if we look at Google Trends, if we compare big data with Internet of Things, we see that uh, big data was really popular term. But the interesting thing is that now, from 2016, uh, the Internet of Things is getting much more popular than, uh, than big data. So I think this is a trend that, uh, that tells us that yeah, the Internet of Things is going to be important in the next, uh, in the next and coming years. OK, so now, in terms of analytics, so what is the difference between the analytics on the Internet of Things and the standard analytics? So in the traditional analytics, or what we call the batch setting, basically we have uh, our data set, and then that could be stored in memory or in disk, and then what we do is that we build our model. Okay? So, and then we have this data set stored there, we can do many, many different uh, passes over the data, and we can usually we don't have restrictions of, of time and memory. And an important thing is that all the data sets should uh, be static. So all the data uh, corresponds to the same uh, distribution of data. We don't suppose that there is change over the data. So this is the, the standard uh, setting. The problem what is that in the Internet of Things, data is going to be arriving continuously. It's going to be produced. So we are not going to have all the data set stored in memory or, or in disk. So we need to be really, really uh, fast. And we can do only one pass over the data. And the other important thing is that data may be changing. Okay, so we cannot assume that data is going to be static. So, uh, what is the Internet of uh, Things uh, setting for analytics? The idea then is that we're going to have uh, data that comes from our data stream, and instead of uh, creating our model with all the data, what we are going to do is that we are going to update. Uh, our model one instance by one instance, okay? So this is the difference. So we are not uh, uh, keeping first all the data. What we are going to do is that we are going to be updating every time the, our, our models. The advantage of this is that, of course, we don't need to store the data because we see data only once we update the model and that's all. So we can be much more efficient. And the other important thing is that data may be changing. Okay, so we don't need to suppose that data is static, and in real settings, data may be changing, and then uh, our model, when we are updating it, is going to be adapted uh, continuously in real time. Okay, so this is the, the big uh, uh, advantage. Okay, so why really we, we need to update our model? So this is an example of a, 
uh, classifier on uh, spam of comments on Yahoo News. So here we have uh, the blue one is <coughs> an initial model that we built. And uh, really, we, we are not updating it. So we create the model at the beginning with all the data, and then we, we use it. And we'll see that over time, the performance of the classifier is going down. Instead, if we have uh, an online model that we are updating continuously, what we see is that the model, the performance of the model is, uh, is uh, still it's not going uh, worse. It's, it's still good because it's able to adapt to the changes over. And over. So this is why this is really needed to to be able to update our model. So when there is change over the data, we can be able to to adapt to to these changes. Okay, so that's the IoT stream mining settings. So here. Uh, what we suppose is that uh, we have restrictions of time of memory. We're going to see data only once. We're not going to store it. And we are going to be able to detect uh, changes. Okay, so we are going to be able to detect changes and adapt to our models. Okay, sometimes, um, yeah, it would be nice to have exact solutions, but the problem is that as we are dealing with this so huge quantity of data, uh, having the exact solution may take uh, too much time. So imagine that. We have to, exact, to compute the exact solution it could take uh, days, and we have we can have an approximate solution uh, with only one percent of error, and we can compute that in seconds. So in streaming, we are going to be interested on that on this approximation algorithm. So the idea is that uh, instead of computing the exact solution, we'll be happy with uh, solutions algorithms that are going to give us uh, solutions to the problem with a small error actually with high probability one minus delta. So only to show you an example, so uh, imagine that uh, we, want, we have events and we want to count events on a stream, and we have only 8 bits. So how many events can we count using only 8 bits? If we want the exact solution, of course we can only keep uh, 256. So the nice thing is that the first paper on, on a stream, a streaming algorithm is this paper from Bob Morris that is called Counting Large Number of Events in the Small Registers. And he was able to, using only uh, one uh, counter of eight bits, he was able to store 130,000 events. Okay? So this is the nice thing of this, that using approximate methods, we can really do a much better use of, of space. So how he was doing this? So it's very simple. The idea is that instead of storing the, the, the count, we, he was storing the logarithmic of the count. Okay, so that's the idea how we can how we can do this. Also, if we set the the right uh, parameters in the logarithmic function, we can have a similar behavior from 10, 0 to 10. So you see, <coughs> we use these uh, parameters. We see that from zero to ten, the behavior is similar to a linear counter. And then after that is when uh, after ten, then we see the difference. Uh, becomes uh, much, much different. The way of this uh, algorithm is really, really simple. So in the standard case, what we were doing is that we have this uh, stream of events. And then every time we had a new event, we were adding one. OK, so that's uh, the standard setting, the exact setting. So now what we are doing is that instead of uh, always add to one, so we have one random number between 0 and 1. And then if uh, this random number is less than a threshold, then we uh, add one to the counter. And if not, we don't add it. The nice thing that then is that if we p is a power of two, then what we are storing is that we're storing the logarithm. Okay, so this is a very nice example of an approximate uh, method. Okay, so it was a bit introduction, so let's uh, introduce some methods for doing machine learning, but specific for, for data streams. So that means that uh, we are not going to store all the data. So we are going to be updating our model. We are not going to have the data stored. So we are only looking data only once. And we should be able to adapt to the changes on the, on the stream. So let's look, for example, start with classification. So as you know, classification, basically what we want, we have instances, and these instances uh, have labels. And we want to predict uh, these uh, discrete uh, labels. And we have data that we use for training, and then uh, with this data, with this data, we built our model, and then we use this to predict uh, instances, new instances that we haven't seen. 
So the idea is that in streaming we should be careful with uh, the restrictions on time and memory and uh, we should be able also to adapt to, to the changes. So let's look at, at the standard uh, classifier. So for example, you know NiveBase is a very simple classifier that is based on the base theorem and basically supposing that uh, all the uh, attributes are independent. And then uh, what it's doing is that it's computing the probabilities for its one of the classes, and then it's taking the, the class that has the, the maximum probability. So to compute this probability, basically we are using counters. We, we are computing the statistics uh, using counters, and then when we need to compute the probabilities, what we do is that we uh, use these counters to compute the probabilities. The nice thing of this is that uh, the, when we want to update our model, the only thing that we need to do is we need to update the counters of that we are using for the probabilities. So this is very, very uh, simple. So this is already incremental. So this is already streaming, and then we don't, really, we don't need to do anything else to, to, to improve this. The perceptron. The perceptron is also a linear classifier that we have a, a set of weights, and then every time we see it, and we get a new instance, we can update the model uh, yeah, using this uh, stochastic gradient descent. So we are minimizing the mean square error. And then what we are doing is that every time uh, we have a new instance, we update the, our model. So this is uh, already streaming. So the difference between the perception in the byte setting and in the streaming is that in the byte setting, we can do many, many iterations over the data. And in the streaming setting, we do only one pass over the data. Yeah, and then basically we do multi-class classification. The only thing that we need to do is that we need to have one perception for each one of the classes and then choose the perception that is giving the, the maximum uh, probability. Okay, with decision trees. With decision trees, the thing is getting much more interesting. So decision trees uh, are very good methods because they are easy to interpret. So as you know, we can see what is happening. So it's, it's very, very convenient because then it's not a black box as other classifiers. So in that case, we can understand how it's making the decisions. And then also it's a very powerful method because uh, it's using these ensemble combinations as random forest or uh, GBDT. So they are really, really powerful components of very, very strong uh, classifiers. So the problem that uh, we have with decision trees is that uh, they are really not streaming because every time we we, do, we need to decide if we split the tree, we need to look at the uh, data that is in memory, and then we need to build uh, the statistics, for example, using information gain, to decide if we split or not. So that's, uh, that's the problem. The problem is that the, the, the way that uh, we build the decision tree is that we do that uh, recursively, so we, we start with the root node. If uh, we see that uh, uh, we improve the information gain, then we are going to, to split it, and if not, we're not going to split it, and we do that recursively for all of the nodes. Uh, when we need to decide if we split or not, the problem is that we need to compute the information gain, and this is uh, stored in, in memory. So how we can build a decision tree that is streaming? So basically what we need to do is that <coughs> Instead of uh, looking at the data that is in memory to compute the information gain, what we are going to do is that we are going to wait to new instances to arrive. Okay, and then we are going to use the new instances to compute uh, uh, the information gain. The problem now is going to be how many instances do we need to compute uh, the information gain. So this is uh, why yeah, we have this uh, method that is called very fast decision tree or hogging tree. And and the idea that is called Hoffing tree because it uh, uses the Hoffing bound to compute how many instances do we need for, for deciding the, the, the splits. Okay, so the idea is very simple. So it's like the standard decision tree. The only thing is that when we want to decide if we split or not, we are going to wait to new instances to arrive. And then to decide how many instances uh, do we need, we are going to use the Hoffing bound to compute uh, that the difference between the be two best attributes Okay. For example, if we're using information gain, the, the difference between the information gain of the two best attributes is higher than a threshold that is computed using the Hoffing bound. Okay. So as you see, it's a very simple idea, but it's really, really powerful. 
So the, the method is, is really uh, simple. So we have the stream, data are arriving. We see the data that is arriving. We send the data to the nodes. And then in the node, we only do this uh, checking of the housing map. And then we, we do the split. So the nice thing is that uh, we really have theoretical guarantees. So if really we have enough data, the decision tree that we get is going to be the same, the equivalent to the one using the standard decision tree. The other thing is that we really need a lot of data. Because uh, yeah, as you can imagine, we are always, to build the tree, to grow the tree, we need instances to, to, to combine. OK, so yeah, this is a really uh, a very nice uh, method. And the, I think the most interesting thing is that it's really, really fast. So all the methods that uses these, uh, yeah, these decision trees, we see that uh, if running the standard decision tree can take hours, uh, with this housing tree, we can do that in seconds. So it's really, really uh, efficient. OK, so that goes for uh, classification. If we look at regression, basically, the setting is similar. So now the only difference is that we are uh, predicting numeric values. OK, so that's a set of predicting classes. We're going to be predicting numeric values. So there are many examples where the thing is that the target that we want to predict is numeric. Of course, we can use the perceptron. This is really uh, similar. And basically, now the difference is that now we are going to be predicting a numeric value, but still we are going to use stochastic gradient descent, and also we are going to be minimizing the mean square error. In terms of uh, decision trees, this is really, really similar. So the only thing that we are going to change is that instead of using information gain, uh, now what we are going to do is that we are going to use a variance reduction. Okay, so the idea is that uh, we really want that all the instances that are in this node are, are similar. So we want to reduce the, the, the variance. And then instead of uh, using the average majority class inside the, the, the leaves of the prediction, we're going to use the, the average uh, uh, target value. So we're going to use the, the average. OK, but these are the only two changes that we need uh, for this. All the rest is going to be uh, the same. Another method that is uh, useful is this uh, uh, adaptive rules. So the idea now is that instead of having uh, the rules in a, in a tree structure, we are going to be able to construct an independent set of rules uh, that are going to have a similar uh, structure as the, the, the tree. We are going to have these conditions. Okay, so this is in the tree. This is are the different uh, nodes. And the final, we have the final, uh, the tree is the leaf, so here it's going to be the final uh, prediction. The nice thing is that we have this uh, set of rules, and they don't have this uh, limitation or this restriction of being in a tree structure. So we have this method, it's called adaptive model rules. The idea is that we start with a default rule, and then we start also using the housing bound in a similar way to the, to the housing tree. We start creating this. Uh, these new rules, and then uh, we build this set of rules, and then we use this combination of this uh, set of rules to, to make the, the predictions. Okay, so that's, that's uh, as I said, this is the idea. So we start, uh, the instances arrive, we check uh, if there is an anomaly, just to, to check uh, if uh, it's an anomaly we're not going to add to, to the rules, and if not, then what we do is that. Uh, uh, we update the statistics and then we try to, to expand the rule. Okay, and then expanding the rules, we build these new rules that are going to make this set and we are going to use them to, to make the predictions. Okay, so this is was classification and regression. So now let me talk about uh, concept view. So what happens when data is changing? Then we need to adapt uh, our models. So we are going to use this uh, concept drift. Uh, methods, so concept with change uh, detection method. So the idea now is that we have this stream of uh, values that are arriving and then we want to detect if there is change in this, uh, in this uh, sequence of, of data. Okay? So basically we want to, to output an alarm when we see that there is change, but also at the same time we would like to predict what is going to be the next uh, value, so and we want to minimize uh, this, this error. So yeah, basically, we have this uh, structure of uh, change detection. So we have, we have an estimator, 
uh, that is going to help us to, to give estimation. Then we have the change detector, and the one that is going to raise the alarm. And then finally, we've got this memory that is going to help us to make uh, better, better predictions. So there are different change detectors. So maybe the simplest one is this cumulative sum. This is the, the QSUM. The idea here is that uh, what we're going to do is that we are going to accumulate, we're going to sum the error. So we are going to, to sum uh, the errors. And then once the error is higher than a certain threshold, then we are going to output the, the alpha. Okay? So that's the basic idea of, of this system. Um, we are going also to smooth yeah, using this factor B. So when we are going to add this, we are going to add this uh, using this uh, the difference of this uh, value to, to make it uh, smoother. As you see, this is a very, very simple because we only need to keep one counter to keep the, the data. And the problem is that we need to define these two parameters. And this is what is really more challenging because then we really need an expert user who needs to decide uh, what, is the, what are these parameters. So that depends on the data. And then depending on the data, the optimal value could be one or another. Okay, another test is uh, another change uh, detector is this Page Kingly test. So here, this is really really similar to the cumulative sum. Maybe the, the only difference here is that uh, yeah, we still do this. Uh, we, we are accumulating the sum, and then basically, what we need to decide if we raise the alarm or not, we are going to look at the difference between the sum, the cumulative sum that we are doing, and the minimum value of this, uh, this variable that has been accumulated in the sum. Okay, and then if this is higher than this threshold, then we are going to raise the value. So this page cumulative test usually works better than the cumulative sum, but still we have the problem of that we need to decide these two, these two parameters. Another method is this uh, stochastic process control. Method, this is based on the idea of Six Sigma. So the idea here is that uh, we are going to suppose that the data follows uh, Gaussian distribution. And then if we see that the data is uh, uh, outside this uh, Six uh, standard deviation, we are going to suppose that uh, there is change. OK? So yeah, let me show you an example. So imagine that we are uh, rating, you are following the, the, error, class, the error of a classifier. So you know, we start the process, the error rate uh, goes is, uh, is high at the beginning, but then once uh, we update uh, our classifier with models, the error rate goes down until it gets to a stable position where we can say this is the minimum error that we have. But then if there is no change, we're going to be on this area, but uh, if there is a change distribution, then uh, what can happen is that uh, the error starts to increase. So when we are going to say that we have uh, we have been detecting a change, so once we are in a, a distance of two uh, the standard uh, distribution of this uh, minimum value, we are going to raise an alarm of warning. So we are saying, okay, so maybe there's going to be change. And once we are in a three uh, sigma, uh, yeah, in a distance of uh, three uh, standard deviation, then we are going to say that uh, it was change. The nice idea of this warning signal is that we can start a new classifier once we detect that uh, we have this, uh, this, uh, this warning. We start uh, this new classifier, and then once we detect the change, then what we do is that we replace this, uh, the old classifier by the new one that we started, uh, what we started uh, creating here. OK, so this is our change detectors. But then uh, let's see how we can uh, adapt this, how we can put them into these uh, uh, classifiers. So in the terms of uh, the decision tree, so there is this method that is called uh, concept of acting uh, BFDT. So the idea here is that what we are going to try to have a decision tree that is going to be consistent with a sliding window. OK, so imagine that then we decide uh, Designing window of 1,000 instances or 10,000 instances, and then every time that we new instances arrive, we are going to remove the old instances on the on the sliding window, and then we are going to be adapting the decision tree conforming to, to this. Okay, so this is a very nice method that was from the same group uh, of Pedro Domingos, that uh, the ones that they 
they propose the BRTT, the housing tree. The, the only problem here is maybe is how we decide what is the size of the window. Because imagine that uh, the, the scale of change is uh, around uh, a minute, then if we use a scale uh, of change of hours or days, that could not be good, or the other way, right? the, the scale of change is, uh, is days, and we are using a, a slight window of seconds or minutes, uh, this is not going to work. So that maybe is the inconvenience of how to decide uh, what is the, the optimal value for the sliding window. We have these uh, new methods that they try to, to solve this, the idea of not having to decide what is the size of the sliding window. We have this BF DTC. The idea here is that uh, uh, we use change detectors to do this. So if there is no change, we are not going to modify the tree. But if there is change, uh, then what we are going to do is that we are going to create new branches and then we are going to replace the, the old branches by the new branches that are going to be much more accurate. So we have uh, this tree, we have this uh, uh, housing adaptive tree. The idea here is that it's also made uh, with this idea of having, in this case, this is uh, these Alwin change detectors. And then uh, what we are doing is that uh, we see there is a change on the, on the error of the the branches, we start creating new branches and we replace the new branches, the old branches by the new branches. So the idea then is, imagine that we have this structure of tree at the beginning, but then suddenly the things change. So imagine that we are predicting sales and the sales on the weekends are always uh, higher, but then something happens and then the, the sales on the weekends go down. So the idea then is that our tree is going to be, it's going to detect this change and then it's going to change uh, the branches inside the tree, so it's going to be, uh, it's going to be adapted to the new uh, distribution that is uh, creating the, the data. Okay, so yeah, let me uh, present a little bit uh, about uh, clustering. So, uh, as uh, in classification and regression, uh, we have uh, label data. So that it's easier to, we can train our models, but in many applications we don't have label data. Then this is why clustering is so uh, interesting in the sense that uh, we really don't need uh, uh, yeah, label data to build uh, our models. So clustering basically is to create uh, these uh, uh, groups of data, is try to, to create uh, this uh, aggregation and see what are these uh, uh, clusters, that is going to be the groups that of data that is uh, similar. So in streaming, uh, we have the problem that we first we are not storing the data, then uh, we need to be uh, adaptive, and we really need to be very, very fast. And as you know, if we look at the methods as k-means, the problem with k-means is that really we need to do many, many iterations over the data. We need to do uh, two steps, one is to, to assign the the points to, to the cluster and then to recompute the centroids of the cluster. We need to do that many, many times. The problem here in streaming is that we really need to be very, very fast and we cannot start doing iteration because then this is going to be really, really time consuming. So we have uh, different uh, approaches uh, as uh, yes, in, in this by setting, we have um, methods as k means, no? this distance space. So in, in streaming, we have clustering. In, in standard um, clustering, we have uh, DV scan for density methods. So here we have this uh, dense stream. So we have uh, these uh, different approaches. Um, the main characteristic of clustering for streaming is that we use this idea of uh, microclusters. So the idea of microclusters is that. Uh, so if computing the clusters is really, really heavy because we need to do these several iterations. So we would like to maintain online these microclusters. So this is something that we can do very, very fast. And then after we compute these microclusters very, very fast, then we compute the final clusters using these uh, microclusters. So imagine that we have 10 million points. So what we are going to do is that we are going to maintain online only 100 uh, microclusters. And then when we need the cluster, we're going to do a fast k-means or DV scan over these 100 uh, points. Okay, so this is the, the idea of, of, uh, of stream uh, clustering. We're going to divide this in, into two parts. 
into this own line that is really, really fast where we compute these microclusters. And then the nice thing is that to, to store these microclusters, we need only a constant space. So we don't really need to, to uh, yeah, it's really a small amount of memory that we need. And we keep this uh, in a very, very fast and efficient way. So the data that we keep in these clusters, we call it uh, these feature vectors. We give only the number of points, the sum of values, and the sum of the, sum of the squared values. So doing this, we can compute the, all the properties that we are interested in, the centroid radius and, and diameter. OK, so yeah, so th this was the, the first method that was uh, built and then uh, clustering. The idea here is that, um, as I said, we have these two phases, the online phase, where we use that we update the microclusters. If there is a, a microcluster that does not correspond to the current distribution, then we create a new microcluster. And then, uh, yeah, and then the idea that is that we keep this pool of microclusters, and then we keep updating this very, very fast. And finally, when we need the, to, to get the, the clusters, what we do is that we do uh, fast uh, standard clustering method as k-means or, or this kind. Okay, so this is for, for uh, clustering, but this is uh, most similar to k-means. If we look at DBSCAN, so you know DBSCAN is this method uh, for uh, bytes uh, setting that the idea then is that instead of looking at as spherical clusters like in k-means here, what we look is at the density areas where the points we say that they are uh, connected or they are reachable. So the idea of DBSCAN is that we start with one point, and then we look at all the points that are reachable from this point, and then we create this cluster. So, so once we finish this, we go to another set of points, and again, we start with one point, and then we look at what are the points that we can reach from that point. And then we form another cluster. So we do this, um, we do this uh, for all the points that we have in the cluster. So this is a very, very nice method, because this has allowed us to, to, keep, uh, to have uh, clusters that are not uh, spherical. Okay, so that's a, so for streaming, the problem then is that, yeah, we can, we don't have all the data, so what we are doing is that, uh, what, um, basically, uh, yeah, we have all the data that is arriving, so we need to do another way. So this is why we have this mainstream that it's uh, based on DBSCAN, but also at the same time it's based on the idea of, of microclusters. So what we are doing is that we are going to keep this uh, set of uh, uh, microclusters, and then these are going to be updated online, very, very, very fast, very efficient. And then at the end, once uh, we need to compute the final, uh, once we need to compute the final cluster, we are going to apply DBSCAN and get the, the final, the final cluster. Okay. So yeah, in terms of evaluation. So in clustering, yeah, we have these different measures, so internal or, or external. So that depends if we know the ground truth or not. If we know the ground truth, then basically the measures are like are similar to, to the ones on classification. And if not, then basically what we do is that we look at the, at the distances, at measures that depends on the distances of, of uh, inside the clusters, the points inside the clusters, and the, the points from the different clusters, the distance between the different clusters. So we look at the cohesion and the separation of the clusters. And also in streaming, we have uh, specific measures uh, for evaluating clusters where we, we look at also the, the missed points and misplaced points and the noise. So we can also look at uh, uh, all of these things that happen in clusters in streaming that they appear, they fade, they move, they merge, all of these uh, combinations. Okay, so yeah, you want? I, I will skip that. Huh? We skip that. Okay, so then uh, we'll do novel class detection. Uh, my name is Lato Fukan, and uh, I'm sorry I was late for a bit. <laughs> I was not staying here by the time. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about concept evaluation and the, some work in the over the stream data. So Albert already introduced data stream. So let me introduce the what is concept evaluation I meant here, and what are the shortcomings of the existing techniques, and how we can address that issue current state of the art. So <clears throat> the stream data are continuously coming, as Albert said. 
So here our goal is to focus on the classification problem. And classification is a supervised learning, so you need some ground truth to build a model. And once the test data comes, you want to do the prediction or the come up with the class level. And possible application, think about in the security domain where network traffic comes, it passes the firewall. Firewall will have a bunch of rules. And it will, <clears throat> if the network traffic contains a particular IP ad source IP address, let's say firewall said, block that traffic. If not, then allow it and so on. And a particular port, this type of rule will be there. But there is no guarantee that. So there is no guarantee that uh, if it part, let me use this. So there is no guarantee that uh, firewall give you guarantee that the traffic will be once the traffic passes the firewall, the the traffic will be benign. Still, there might be some malicious traffic can pass the firewall rule and so on. So what we want to do, we want to deploy a classification technique here. And the classification technique will predict whether the incoming traffic is, after passing the firewall, it is a benign or malicious. If it is benign, we will pass it, otherwise we will quantify and do the further uh, check. So the key point here is, let's say you build a classification model based on your ground truth data at the beginning of the year, and then you try to use this classification model for the rest of the year. So, but there's a uh, problem is, attacker may not follow the same pattern. So attacker may change the attack pattern. So in that case, since attacker is changing attack attack patterns, so in that case, the classific classification model or the, the model you built that might be obsolete very soon. So if you do not up update your model on time, then the model will perform poorly. And that's a very common scenario in a stream domain. So the key point is, whatever the model you will build, you need to update the model. So now the question is, at which point you will update? You can update very frequently or you can update, if you do update frequently, then it is possible that it may be able to catch the new attacks and so on. If you do not update at all, then you may not be able to catch new attacks and so on. So this is the requirement for the, the stream classification. The key point is you need to update the model and you need to update the model at the right time. And then a stream domain, uh, Albert, uh, Albert already pointed out that there is a concept drift happening, characteristics of data are changing. So there is a possibility that brand new class may emerge in the stream. So for example, this is one particular data set we have in a particular uh, uh, week. Let's say we have a, some, uh, without loss of any idea, let's say we have a two dimensional data and the data has a two classes, positive class and negative class. Now new data points comes like this, all this X, and this new data should not belong to any of this existing class. It should be a part of the, it should not be a part of the positive class or negative class. It should form a brand new class or novel class. That we call it uh, concept evaluation. And this is very common in a stream. Let's say you build a model on a class A, class B, class C, and then new data points are coming, some of them belong to class A, some of them belong to class B, some of them belong to class C, but all on a sudden, a new, <coughs> uh, new classes are in, uh, new classes emerging. That means say, we may have some test points having class level D, and the classifier, the model we built so far, only knows class A, B, C. It doesn't have any idea about class D. So if you use the typical machine learning technique or data mining technique, the existing technique I will not be able to catch this new new class or novel class or emerging class. So that's the shortcomings of the existing work. So before going to talk about that, how we can address that issue, what are the people are doing, uh, let me introduce you. Uh, there are two ways uh, the, uh, the classification, stream classification technique can work. One is the incremental learning. Uh, you build the model and you update the model continuously. Each test instance comes when you will do the prediction. When the ground truth is available, you will update the model immediately. So that's one approach. Uh, a single model will be maintained. Uh, the other approach is called ensemble-based technique. In the literature, it shows ensemble-based technique is more effective. Ensemble means we'll keep multiple models over time. So here's an example. We keep three models 
So when the test data comes, each of them uh, test data comes, uh, X is a test data, I want to predict what will be the class level. And so the model will say, the po uh, majority says the positive class, therefore X will be declared as a positive class. So this is the basic idea. But you can do, instead of majority voting, you can do the weighted voting and so on. But in the literature it shows the result is very similar, it's not that significant. And then, the how do you do the, this part is testing, but how do you do the training or how do you update your model? So one possible way is in the past, uh, uh, people do, they divide the data into a number of chunk. So let's say first thousand instances will form chunk one, next thousand instances will form chunk two, and so on. So and then in this case, the first thousand instances will form chunk one, and we have some ground truth in the first three thousand instances. We build a model M1, M2, M3, and the ensemble size is three. And so we keep, actually, <coughs> we have an animation, but anyway, so we have PDF, so it has been messed up. So M1, M2, M3, uh, let's say F D1, D2, D5, these are the uh, chunk you have, and from, you have the ground truth in the training data you have. So you build a model M1, M2, M5, and ensemble will have this model. Now the test data comes. Test data, this test chunk will have a bunch of data points. You'll take each of these data points and ensemble will come up with the prediction with the majority voting and so on. So you will continue. And now time passes. Okay. Uh, so time passes, you may have some ground truth on the, on the D6 uh, data chunk. So uh, once you have the ground truth, you build the model. So once you build the model, you need to update the model. One possible way is, is you can simply add this model, M6 model, into this ensemble. But what will be the problem? Problem is, over time, ensemble size will grow. So you don't want that ensemble size should grow indefinitely. So, so that's one problem. So how we solve it? Basically, the idea is we need to find a replacement or victim from M1, M4, M5, which one is performing worse on the most recent training chunk. Most recent training chunk, D6 will become a training chunk after testing. So we, let's say we observe that M4 is performing worse on the D6 uh, training chunk. So M4 will be thrown away and M6 will be in. So that way we update the model. And that way we argue that we can handle the concept drift to some extent because we have characteristics of data are changing. So we are trying to cope with that by updating the model. But still the, this work doesn't uh, consider the concept evaluation on novel class. So here I will talk about the concept evaluation of the novel class, more details. So why the, this method cannot detect X is a... So this X, you can see here that this, this is one particular uh, chunk and where you have some ground truth positive class and negative class and you will come up with the ones you have a tr uh, training data, you build a model, let's say decision tree is constructed like this, positive class and negative class. So now test data comes, we will say this x fa falls into this quadrant that therefore this x will be declared as a positive class. In this case, this x will be declared as a ne negative class. But the point I'm trying to make here, this x should not form any, should not be a part of any existing class. In other words, it should not be a part of positive class or it should not be a part of negative class. It should form a brand new class. Why with typical machine learning or classification model cannot detect this as a novel class? Because the way the decision boundary is constructed in this case is at the coarser grain. So we want to construct the decision boundary at the finer grain. So one possible way is if you can model that instead of representing them by quadrant, if you can represent them by some sort of polygon or some sort of uh, clustering algorithm that might be useful. So that's uh, the so what I'm trying to say here, you need to model the decision boundary you, uh, some, in a finer grain instead of coarser grain. So for that, we have the following steps. So we'll create and save the decision boundary in a finer grain using some sort of clustering algorithm. And then when the test data comes, we'll see whether the test data forms an outlier or not. So basically, if it's not covered by the finer grain decision boundary, then we call it outlier, and then we'll check further whether outlier form a novel class or not. So the last two steps are for the testing, and these steps for training. So let me explain more details what I meant. 
So how here is a in the <coughs> I said we want to construct the decision boundary at the finer grain. So for that semi supervised clustering is used. So for example, in a particular chunk you have some training data like this. So you have training data and um, some of the data points may have a level, some of them may not. So black dot represents unlabeled data and then the rest colorful uh, instances represents the corresponding class. So these are the instances represent red class. These are the instances represents the blue class. And then you apply a clustering algorithm. In the clustering usually in general is unsupervised learning, but here we use semi-supervised clustering algorithm because we want to exploit the cluster level during the clustering process. I'm sorry, you want to use the instance level during the clustering process. So usually when you do the clustering, what do we try to optimize? We try to optimize the intercluster distance. So we want to put the points close to the nearest centroid. But here, the objective function not only reduce the intercluster distance, we want to reduce the cluster impurity. Impurity means, I said, we may have some level data points. So let's say in a particular clusters, we have 100 points. Among these 100 points, 10 of them have a class level, and the rest of the 90 points do not have any class level. So among these 10 level points, nine of them belong to a positive class, and one of them belong to the negative, uh, negative class. So in that case, cluster purity is 90%, 9 over 10. And impurity is 10%. So that, that's then we try to um, use it here in the objective function. On the objective function, we not only minimize the intercluster distance, we also try to minimize the cluster impurity. And we show that this is very similar to the, this impurity function is very similar to the uh, entropy in the paper. Then, so that way we build the clusters. So in a nutshell, you can think about you, know, th you can think about you have let's say thousand points here in this chunk and you build the clusters instead of building a b c d quadrants uh, using the decision tree you will build a cluster let's say 400 points belongs here and in this quadrant 400 here 100 100 here and if you run k means clustering algorithms with 100 clusters in this case uh, we expect that for 40 clusters will be built here, 40 will be built here, 10 will be built here, 10 will be built here. Proportionately, we will build the cluster. And that way, we will keep the clusters uh, centroid information, each cluster centroid information, radius, and some other statistical information. And we discard all the raw data points. And now, when the test data comes, I say we want to do the uh, prediction whether it is an outlier or not and if it is an outlier we will do further check whether it forms a novel class or not. So recall that we, we maintain ensembles. So ensemble has a n number of models and one of the model will be represented like this. So uh, let's say you have an ens ensemble size is 3. So that means in the ensemble we will keep 3 models and each of the model will be represented like this. So we will maintain each model will maintain a number of clusters and the clusters uh, centroid, each cluster centroid, then radius, other statistical information will be. It's very similar to what uh, Albert uh, just covered it five minutes ago about uh, uh, microclusters. You can think about the same. So now, when the test data comes, what will happen? In the one particular model, uh, this AX is a test data, and this AX is covered by this cluster. How would you determine that? You will calculate the distance between X and this cluster centroid and that distance is less than the radius of the cluster, therefore x is covered by this cluster. And then we will say that this x is not an outlier, this x will be classified as an existing class and typical uh, classification technique will be used. On the other hand, this case, this x is not covered by any of these uh, classes, clusters. Therefore, we, in this model, we say that this is an outlier. And that way, each of this model will determine whether a test point is an outlier or not. What we call it raw outlier. And if all the models say is a raw raw outlier, then we call it uh, it will be a filtered outlier, and it might be a potential candidate for the novel class. We cannot say immediately this will be a novel class because this uh, outlier thing may happen due to the concept drift or con noise or concept evolution or the novel class. So we need to isolate those scenarios. 
And if it is not an outlet, if say if one of the models says not an outlet, then we will classify it as existing class, and so that way based on the proximity or the nearness property. Now, if all of them say is an outlet, then we will check whether there is a novel class happens or not. So one of the assumption here in the, in this work, the author assumed that when the novel class emerges, it will not emerge as a single class instance. In the stream, a set of points will form first outlets, and they will have the similar characteristics. The similar characteristics means they will represent the uh, novel class or brand new class in the stream. And so that's why we said, once we have an outlet, we will see whether those outlets uh, form certain characteristics or not. By the way, when you build a cluster, how do you say that a cluster is a good quality clusters? You will determine the intercluster distance. The cluster should be tight. At the same time, the cluster should be far away from the other cluster. In, uh, intro cluster distance should be minimized, and the intercluster distance should be maximized. So then we try to capture it using the Schiller coefficient. So for each of these filter outlier points, we will determine how this uh, those outlier points, either they are close to each other and at the same time they are uh, far away from the existing uh, classes, clusters or not. So what I meant is this. So let's say these black dots represents uh, in the stream as an outlier. So one particular model declare all of these black, black dots filtered outlier. Uh, and then we will see those filtered outliers uh, form a brand new class or not. So brand new class, I said, uh, filter outlier, I cannot say immediately this is a novel class because this may happen due to the noise or due to the concept drift or novel class. So the idea is when the novel class will emerge, it will not emerge in isolation. A set of outlier points will have the similar characteristics. Similar characteristics means they should be close to each other. And at the same time, these outlier points should be far away from the existing classes clusters. So in this case, existing classes cluster means positive class and negative class in this example. And so these outlier points or black dots will be far away from the existing classes clusters. And at the same time, they will be close to each other. If that characteristics reveal, then we will say that these outlier points will form a novel class or brand new class. So that we try to capture it using the Q nearest neighborhood Schiller coefficient for X. So if particular outlier points x is q nearest neighborhood Schiller coefficient is greater than zero means the point is closer to the other outlier points at the same time it is far away from the existing classes clusters. So what I meant here, we compute the q nearest neighborhood Schiller coefficient and if we have at least q number of outlier points have these characteristics, we call it novel class. Otherwise it will be a, belong to an existing class. So that's where the author did. And uh, okay, so there are some problems in that work. First of all, uh, in this work, the authors observe that uh, sometimes they observe high false positive rate and high false negative rate. What is false positive rate means uh, existing class instances will be declared, declared as a novel class. On the other hand, false negative means some novel class instances will be declared as a as a uh, novel class instances will be declared as an existing class. So that's uh, the problem with that word. And also in the stream, it is possible that more than one novel class may emerge simultaneously. So if that's the case, then the the solution I showed you so far may, it works only. It can it, it will just say that. In the stream, we have only, it will say that there is a novel class, but it will not be able to tell you how many novel classes are, in, are there. So that's the shortcomings of the previous work. So the authors try to address those two issues. So for this, how, how many novel classes are there? So the idea is this, the author uses uh, uh, the, uh, first, they detect says these are the possible novel classes. Then they apply clustering algorithms, and uh, and then apply a graph where the outlier cluster is a vertex, and then the merge the vertexes and find out how many 
and these joint components are there. That way, they try, the authors determine how many Nobel classes are there. And on the other hand, in order to reduce the high false positive rate, have a high false negative rate. So the authors did this. If they have a high false positive rate, then they inflate the Bayesian boundary. If there is a high false negative rate, they deflate the Bayesian boundary. So that way, they try to tackle that issue. And there is another issue in the work we have presented so far. Uh, the issue is a class emerges, a novel class emerges, and then it disappears and it reappears again. Not necessarily a novel class. Let's say in the stream, class A appears at the beginning, then it, it doesn't appear for a while, and it reappears again after the chunk, 100 chunk. So in that we call it recurrence class. And on the other hand, if a novel class means in this case that class has not been the, um, has not been seen before, so these are two different things. Recurrence class means periodically class may re, uh, reappear, uh, class appears and disappears and then reappears again. So the the way I, I presented the work so far, the it will not be able to differentiate between the novel class and the recurrence class. Recurrence class in this the way I presented so far, it will declare recurrence class as a novel class. Let's say for example in this uh, slide, so we have a, a particular chunk and this chunk we have two classes, uh, uh, the black dot and then the white dot and then time passes, this novel class will emerge because this is a novel class because this class never appears in the stream. And then you can see in the stream this black dot class vanishes. Now it reappears after 100 chunk. So in that case, this is a recurrence class because this class appears at the beginning, right? So the, the problem is the way the ensemble based technique it, it works. In the ensemble we keep multiple models and uh, multiple models may not have any, may discard this class in the past, this, uh, this black dot class from the, from the ensemble. Uh, this ensemble may discard this black dot class after a while. So in that case when it reappears again, Ensemble will not be able to capture uh, say that this is a recurrent class the way we uh, the the current algorithm has been implemented. So we need to address that issue. So what the, the author did, this author did uh, one possible possibility is when you discard a model, you will see that the mod in the ensemble. I said we replace. Okay, so what I'm saying here, in the ensemble, we take multiple models. So well, let's say one of the model uh, keeps track of this class, and then time passes, the model has been replaced by the new model. So the old model has been replaced, which captures this class, has been replaced by the new model. So that means now the ensemble may not have any knowledge about this class. When the new class emerges, I'm sorry, when this class emerges, the, 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 uh, the, all this outlier detection will declared as a novel class and so on. So, so the recurrence class will be declared as a novel class. So the solution is, when you discard a model, you will see whether the model contains a class, that class uh, is, uh, the, so you, you should not, uh, that model represents a class which is uh, which is not covered by other models. So in that case, you should not uh, you should drop it from the ensemble, but you will keep it in your additional ensemble auxiliary ensembles and so on. So that's one possible possible way the author address that issue. Another possible way is instead of uh, chunk based ensemble, you will maintain a class based ensemble. So class based ensemble means for each uh, here we do divide the data into a number of chunk and for each chunk we build the models and so on. So I'm saying uh, for class based ensemble means uh, for, for this, let's say for this white dot class you will maintain multiple models and for black dot class you will maintain multiple models over time and you will update the models but you will never discard the class. So in that case, that problem, recurrence problem will be solved. So class-based ensemble you will keep. 
Okay. Yeah, that's true. So is this like an uh, uh, infinite process? or uh, So most likely for a lot of problems, we have a finite number of the classes. Even this uh, finite number is unknown before you uh, start the operations. So like this process, once you, for example, have uh, enough accumulations, and do you are pretty confident that I have uh, already observed all the classes here. So is there a uh, stop point, or this is like uh, iterative? Uh, it's, so an like it's, an so it's an iterative process, so we're saying because in the stream you cannot say that I see so far all the classes. New class may emerge at any time. So you will, so class based ensemble we will keep so far whatever the classes you see, for each of this class you build a number of models in the class based ensemble. So that way, that way you will uh, continue. But in the literature, we observe that class based ensemble may not be that effective. Sometimes uh, performance may degrade because I think it's, uh, there is a two types of model generative and the other model. So there are some issues there. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so this is the recent work. The one of the criticism for the, the work I presented so far, we assume that the data will be divided into a number of chunk. And so first, first thousand instance will be a chunk one, second thousand instance will be a chunk two. So you can see the chunk is a equal length in size. And now the problem is, uh, the, the problem with the fixed chunk size is you need to know, you need to set the chunk right chunk uh, size. If you do not set the right chunk size, there will be a performance will degrade. So I will tell you in a minute. Here is a, what I meant. Let's say this is a fixed chunk size. That means thousand instances will form chunk one, second thousand instances will form chunk two, and so on. Now the problem is, let's say after this is a chunk number three, and after the chunk size is thousand. And after the 100 instance, there is a concept drift happen or concept evaluation happens, novel classing one. So then what you will do, you need to wait additional 900 instance. After that, you will update the model. So once you wait nine additional 900 instance, what will happen? So the, there is a very likely, very likely that uh, the, the model or the, the ensemble based technique will not be able to predict those 900 instances correctly. So if you cannot predict 900 instances, uh, new uh, incoming instances correctly, then what will happen? The performance, uh, the overall performance may degrade. So this is one problem when you set the chunk size very large. But now, now you may argue, why don't you set the chunk size small? If you set the chunk size small, then what will happen? You will f do the frequent update. So if you do the frequent update, that means uh, you will utilize a lot of resources and so on. But there is a possibility that there is no concept drift or concept evaluation. Basically, you don't need to update the model, but still you are updating it. So there is a trade-off. So we, the point I'm at the beginning, I tried to tell you that we need to update the model, the classification model. So now the key point is we need to update the classification model at the right time. So now the question is what is the right time we can determine? If we set the right classify the, the chunk size boundary too large, then perform, uh, the classified performance may degrade. Uh, on the other hand, if you set the chunk size too small, then you will need to, you may, you may do a lot of unnecessary work. So can we find a better way to deal with that? And then there are some work by Al Albert in the past. So, so one idea is, uh, the fixed decaying rates, so that's one way, and then another way is uh, another way is this. Another way is uh, can we come up with the dy dynamic chunk boundary? So that means we will start with a particular small window. So by saying that, let's say uh, this case, we will say that. We'll start with that boundary, say so let's say 100 instance, and then we will monitor the classifier performance or the ensemble's performance. So if the performance doesn't change that much, then we are happy with the current model. If the performance 
classic uh, more ensembles performance degrades significantly then we say that we need to update the model now the key issue is here the problem is one possible way is how do you determine the ensembles performance we can monitor the error rate of the ensemble and uh, if the <coughs> If the ensemble shows a bad performance, we'll update the model. But the, what is the problem with that approach? The problem is this is a fully supervised model because we okay. The uh, the problem is. We expect that we will estimate the, you are doing the testing, right? And you are expecting that we want to determine the error rate of the models or the ensembles. And once you, in order to do estimate the error rate, you need to, we assume that somebody will provide the levels. And in stream, this might not be a practical solution. The stream data are continuously coming. Some of the cases, they may come with a very high speed. And there's the big data things. So that solution suffers with that because it's a fully supervised, so which may not be a feasible solution. So what the author did in this work, they instead of relying on the error rate, uh, the the we uh, the authors rely on the classifier confidence. So you recall that when the test data comes, the ensemble will come up with a prediction. And in the say it says that ensemble will say that it belongs to this instance test instance belongs to a positive class with 95 percent confidence. And the next uh, test data comes, uh, the ensemble will say that it belongs to a negative class with uh, 85 percent confidence. Something like this. So that you will have a bunch of each test data comes and you will have a confidence value will be associated with it. And the idea here is if you see the classifier confidence drops significantly in the window, then what does it say? It says that whatever the model is predicting, the model is not doing, model is obsolete basically, it's not doing the right way, it's not coming up with the right prediction or it can be suspicious. So that's the very basic idea at that point you can update the model. On the other hand, if you are in the window, if you see that classifier confidence is very high or reasonably high then you will continue with the with the model you will increase the window size by one and that's the way it works so we will see that if there is a classifier confidence drops or not if there is a drop then we'll update the classifier model and start with the smaller window size if that's not the case then we will increase the window and continue so now the question is, how do you estimate the classifier confidence? So do you have any question? Yeah. So is your method possible to generalize to unsupervised learning problems? Generalize to unsupervised? Right, unsupervised learning. So here, uh, only for the, uh, only for to determine the chunk boundary or the at which point we'll update the model for that we, we do unsupervised method but still <clears throat> let's say we want to determine at which point we'll update the classifier model or class, uh, ensembles so that will be uh, that for that purpose we are using unsupervised learning but when the once you say that we need to update the model still you need the ground truth right and you need to label the data. Right. So, so my question is uh, about that the ground truth. Where so that part we cannot have the ground truth. So then we will expect that the uh, human will provide the ground truth. And I will show you later that uh, uh, when when classifier comes, we use some sort of active learning type of thing. So when the classifier comes up with a prediction, if the test classifier has a very confident that by saying that it belongs to this class with 95% confidence, you can say we may not ask the human to give the level because classifier is very confident so we can rely on that level, on that predicted value as a ground truth. On the other hand, if classifier says it belongs, the particular test instance belongs to a 
class with a low confidence value, say 60 or 70 percent, then in that case, you can ask the human to provide the levels. Okay, so the key point is how do you estimate the confidence? So for that, we use the, uh, we use the, you recall that the work we develop here, we use, uh, at the beginning I showed you, we build up from the training data, we build the finer grain vision boundaries constructed using the clustering algorithm. So in the clusters, what do you have? You have the, uh, the cluster centroid, and then the purity information, how pure the cluster is. If we have the level data there, so that will be exploited to calculate the confidence. So in order to calculate the confidence, again we have n samples, we have a t number of models, and each models will have a. When the test data comes, we will determine how close, uh, how far is it from the closest clusters, by using the association or the proximity, and then how once you and then for that cluster we will determine how pure the cluster is. So the classified confidence will go up when you have a, when the test data is very close to a particular cluster and that cluster is very pure. So that way we measure the classified confidence. So here we have more details. Uh, for each test instance, confidence of the ith model in the ensemble will be calculated by this HIX. The ZI HIX is a vector of estimator values of a test instance. And basically, AI is the association, and PI is the purity, and ZI will be a weight will be calculated from the training data. So what I meant uh, for in case of the test, let's say this X is closest to this clusters, and this cluster you will calculate this distance. Association will be calculated using this. So closer to the cluster uh, centroid, then the association associate AI value will go up. On the other hand, if the cluster is very pure, then the purity value will go up. So that way we will represent. And then for the weight calculation, uh, so if you remember, we have a HIX, that way we will estimate, and the ZI is the weight. So how do you estimate the weight? So we have a training data. So for the training data, Okay, so for now we have a training instance in the model MI, we have a training instance K. So for that we will compute the same way AIK and the PIK, but again recall that this is a training instance. And then we will see, since it is a training instance, we have the ground truth. So we will see whether uh, if GI, if GIK will be 1 if there is an agreement in terms of the prediction and predicted value at the true ground uh, true level. If there is a disagreement, it will be zero. And then we will determine the correlation between AI and the ZI, how much it contributes. And, and then we will uh, do some scanning. So that way we determine this. And now, this example, I will show you how we do this. So let's say test in instance X comes. And this in this model, there are two ensemble sizes three. There are three models we have. So X is closest to these clusters, and in this case X is closest to this cluster for this model, and in this case X is closest to these clusters. And then for each of these uh, clusters, we have the weight Z I Z Z to Z three, uh, and from the training we, we can calculate that. And for the testing case, we calculate the H I X H one H two H three, and then we will uh, do a this classified confidence, this C1 will be calculated based on HI, this multiplied by this, and this multiplied by this dot, dot product. And then we will take the, uh, the class, and since uh, these two agree, and this is a different, a different class, so therefore only this two support will be taken into consideration. But there are some variations are possible anyway. So that way we estimate the So again, recall that that's where we uh, for each test instance comes, we will estimate the classifier confidence. Now, in a window, and we have a n number of n number of points we have c1, c2, c3, all the way to cn. This n number of test points we have so far, and each of this will have a confidence classifier confidence. Now we will see whether the 
classifier confidence drops or not. So for that, we use the change detection algorithm from the uh, QSUM we use. So the idea here is if the, if the classifier confidence drops significantly, then we will say that there is a change happen, we need to update the model. So how do you determine this change? So for that we use, uh, we observe that classifier confidence can be modeled as a beta distribution. So think about this, x-axis represents the confidence values and y-axis represents the probability density function. So over time, uh, if the current model or current ensemble is doing reasonable work, then what do you expect? Classifier confidence should have a high values. So you will see log probability density function in this case uh, is falls into this area. There will be a confidence values, many confidence uh, values will have a very high values in this range. But if the classifier or the ensemble performs poorly, then what will happen? The classifier confidence will drop. So in that case, you will see a lot of confidence values 0.2 therefore uh, the frequency count will increase 0 0.2, 0 0.3 in the window you will see a lot of them will appear. So that's why when there is a change happen or the classifier or the ensemble is performing poorly, the distribution will be something like this. So what I'm saying, this can be, uh, this confidence value can be modeled using the beta distribution and beta distribution has uh, this type of characteristics. It has two parameters, alpha and beta and using that we do this. So now for change detection in the window, we, I said there is a n number of test points and each point will have a confidence and I'm saying in that window I want to determine whether there is a change happen in, the, in terms of the distribution or not. For that we will use the QSUM process and the here uh, there is a before the change, let's say in the n number of win, uh, in the window size n, I want to determine at the kth point whether there is a change happens or not. So if there is a change happens, there will be a beta distributions and after kth point there will be another uh, distribution. If these two distribution differ significantly, then we call it there is a change happens. So for that we use the QSUM process and here uh, the, we try to determine in the end window if there is a change happen at the kth point or not. So this is the gamma is the, uh, the cushion points, how many, at least how minimum window size we will start with. And if this value is greater uh, is a log like, maximum log like you would ratio we are considering. If there is a change, hap uh, change happens, then there will be a WN value should be greater than minus log delta. And delta is a sensitivity parameter. And if the, that, if that way we detect the change. And then, once we determine the change, I said we will update the model. If there is no change, we will increase the window. So now, already some of you pointed out that there is a problem is once we detect the change, we will assume that human will provide the ground truth to update the model and so on. So now, since I criticized at the beginning other guys' work by saying that um, in the stream it might be difficult to provide the level immediately. So can we do, uh, can we provide, <coughs> instead of, let's say we determine that there is a change happens after 1200 instances, now we can assume that human will provide the level for this 1200 instances and we build the model. That's one way you can do it. But if human provides the 12 level for this 1200 instances, it may take time. So can we do, let's say human can do, a human can provide the levels with only 100 instances. So that type of thing we are doing, instead of pro, uh, in the chunk, now that we determine there is a, uh, this is the chunk with the 1200 instances, a human needs to provide the level, that's one possibility, but that will be expensive because human will, be in, will, be, will provide the level and will take time and costly and so on. So can we do, better with the active learning. The idea is we will identify a possible instances which might be troublesome and provide the annotation for those. So here again one possible solution is so typically in a traditional way you will provide the level for all the training data but can we do better? So for that 
one possible way is from these 1200 instances, you can randomly select some instance and ask the human to provide the levels. That's one possible way. Or other way is instead of selecting those points randomly, you will select those points in an intelligent manner. So like what we do in the active learning. So here we will utilize the classifier confidence or ensemble confidence. If ensemble is very confident about a particular instance, then we will not ask the human to provide the level. If the, if the ensemble is not that confident, then we will ask the human to provide the levels. There are other words you can exploit also. Okay, I already covered this. And uh, in this domain, for novel class detection, there are some areas where I think it requires, if still you may consider further research, I mean people can do further research in that domain. One is, uh, the change detection is very computationally expensive. So I have noticed that people use some simple method first if, by using average uh, in the window that we try to determine whether there's a change happens or not. First apply the cheap algorithm like <clears throat> the mean calculation if the mean, diff mean differs between two sub windows significantly then they go to the expensive QSUM process. So that's one way you can do it. But we are looking for some other efficient method for change detection and then in the security area, when you build a model, uh, attacker try to or adversary try to learn your model and <clears throat> come up with the instances that will look like benign, and your model will fail to detect those attack scenarios and so on. So, in the adversarial learning, this might be an important area where we can, how the stream mining can be utilized. And these are the references we use in the, so far the, in the novel class detection or the concept evaluation work. And uh, we'll continue. Yeah, I have uh, yeah, sure. some uh, comments but not specific uh, questions. Sure. So uh, sometimes we, uh, let's say, I, I don't know the uh, number of the classes in my data set, but I do know several classes. And uh, sometimes I do not hear, for example, class one and two. So. I can just remove them and only care about three, four, or some other unknown uh, classes. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, I think this method could be very useful. Mm -hmm. And the second comment is that oh, at you. some points you prop, so th that's the way you mm -hmm. can embed it into yeah. your framework. Yeah. So another comment is about the uh, uh, handling the uh, extremely imbalanced data set. Some yeah, uh, that, that's a very valid, com valid concern, actually. Yeah. If the data is very highly imbalanced, let's say 80% belong to positive class, and well, I'm talking about maybe 99%. Okay, 99%. Yeah, let's say 99% belongs to a benign class, and the, the class one person yeah. belongs to uh, no um, the malicious class. Or right. so in that case, this uh, method will suffer. We suffer. Yeah, we have a problem also. Okay. So we try to do undersampling, oversampling. There are a bunch of words in that. Try, try to address and the imbalance issue in a typical machine learning. We try to use those. The result is uh, not that great. It's really reasonable. But if the class is very good, highly imbalanced, what you said, 0.001% belongs to one particular class and the rest of them belong to a benign class. Say for example, in the cybersecurity domain, attacker right. attack is a very rare event. So in that case. This will be a problem actually, and I think uh, we try to address that issue, but so far we are not that. I'm not going to claim that we solve that problem, but still the problem exists. So that might be a direction you guys can consider if you want to do the stream mining work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So with this, we conclude the first part. Uh, is there any other question of the first part? If not, we will start. We we'll go to the second part. Okay, so this uh, second part is going to be uh, about uh, social network analysis. So, yeah, uh, we have this. Now we, we start to, to look at the case uh, studies. So this is the first case studies, and then we look at, uh, at this uh, network analysis. So we look at uh, the challenges, uh, how to do online sampling, and then we look at the evolving centralities and uh, communities and, and how to track the dynamics of these evolving communities. 
Okay, so yeah, let's start first with the challenges of this uh, uh, network data. So we have many, many different applications. We have all these sensor networks, all these telecommunication networks, all of these social networks. So in all of these cases, we have all of these uh, users that are um, connected. And then uh, the thing is that all of these connections happen in, in real time. So they are really, really fast. It's a huge, huge number. So this is massive. And then we want to see uh, how this uh, evolves over time. So it's not a static network, static graph. Uh, everything is moving, everything is evolving. So we need to see how, how this works. So this is the, the main challenge is how to deal with this large scale and how to deal with all of these changes that are happening in, in these uh, networks. So yeah, let's look for example, uh, typical network of uh, telecommunications calls. So here what we have is you know, we have the users that are doing the call. So we have edges, nodes. The interesting thing is that uh, yeah, users may be calling each one uh, many, many times. So this is why we have this uh, multigraph. Also, the calls could be short or long. So this is also we, we have a weighted graph. Uh, yeah, we have it uh, bidirectional, so there's always one user that is calling the other. Uh, of course, there are users that are not calling very often and users that are calling too much, so uh, we can say that uh, also they follow this power law distribution. Uh, usually, not all users are calling all the users, so we, we see that uh, we have a disconnected graph. Uh, the vertices, it's going to be really irregular, the vertices of nodes are going to have very different degrees. Density of the graph is going to be sparse because many, not uh, the number of users that we are calling is, is really small, so it's going to be really sparse. And also very interesting, this is going to happen in, uh, in this spatial uh, temporal space. Huh? And the nodes at these edges are going to be evolving. So, so maybe one user is calling another user during one day, but then it's starting to call other users completely different. So, so it's going to be really evolving. Nodes, new users are going to appear, users are going to disappear. So everything is going to be really, really evolving. So for example, in this case of this telecommunication network analysis, there are many, many applications. So we can try to predict the behavior of the, the users. We want to maybe do a chart prediction to, to to see when the users want to leave before they do it, a lot of prediction of the calls, uh, of marketing, the word of mouth, so how this is spread around the network, this influence analysis of who are the influencers, how this influence is spread around the network, uh, how we profile the customers, and also event detection. So many, many different uh, applications. But what, what are the problems? Okay, the problems of this is that, yeah, really, this is a huge uh, network. So this is not uh, small networks that we can keep on this and we can do the analysis. So this is our networks that are continuously being produced in real time. So we need to be very, very fast. And uh, we need to be able to compute all of these uh, measures of uh, graph networks, centrality, uh, length, eccentricity. But we need to do that in, in real time. So this is really much more challenging setting than the, than the, the standard one. So how we can solve this? So one way of doing this is doing uh, online sampling. Okay? So the idea is that uh, instead of using all the network, what we are going to do is that we are going to select a subset of these uh, uh, parts of the network, the nodes or edges, and then what we are going to do is that we are going to look at this uh, sampling as the subset, uh, what are the properties and see. Yeah. So this is a way to reduce this uh, big data problem to a small data problem. So the idea is to try to do this online something uh, to reduce the, data, the size of the data set and then we'll be able to perform uh, all of this. So yeah, there's a very wide uh, number of applications on, on, on this uh, online sampling because this allows us to to be able to deal with graph that in the other way we would not be able to, to deal. We, we can compute the, the measure, so this is something that we are always very, very interested in when we have the networks to be able to compute the centrality, betweenness, clustering coefficients, all of this. So this is going to allow us to still be able to compute uh, all of this and also we'll be able to do real-time detection of uh, 
community events or things that are happening on, on, on real time. So yeah, just uh, to show uh, an example, I'm going to show you some charts on this scenario. So this is from uh, telecommunication data. So this is from a telecommunication companies that are the calls. This is about uh, one month of data. It's eight millions, between eight million and sixteen millions calls every day. And this is during all the day. And then uh, we have the nodes are going to be the, the users. The users are calling and the users that are receiving the calls. The edges are going to be the calls. We have a multigraph, we have very, a lot of repetitive edges. And also we have, uh, it's going to be weighted, uh, the frequency of these, uh, these calls. And it's going to be bidirectional, okay, because uh, some of the users are calling the, the other ones. So, yeah, basically what uh, we are interested in this uh, online sampling method is how we can uh, uh, scale to this and how we can see yeah, and, uh, we compute the, the properties of the, of the graph. If still, this is a very good uh, approximation, and if everything uh, works uh, fine. So there are basically two ways of doing this. It is something on the nodes or something on the edges. So if we look at something on the edges, it's nicer because then uh, we have already the nodes and the edges sample. If we do only something on the nodes, the problem then is that uh, we we'll need to to compute. Uh, the edges that are sampled based on these nodes that we have selected. So algorithms for doing this online sampling, I'm going to mention these three ones. It's the reservoir sampling, space saving, and bias random sampling. So reservoir sampling is a very simple method. So the nice idea of reservoir sampling is that we have uh, the property that all the items that are going to be in this uh, sampling are going to have a uniform probability of being there. So that's uh, the, the main property. So the idea is that uh, we are going to look at the data only once. We are only going to do one over, only pass over the data, but the result is going to be uniform sampling. So this is a, a very nice result. The way to do it is very, very simple. So we have this uh, reservoir of k elements. So at the beginning, we put the k elements. And then what we do is that for each new item that arrives, we get a random number between 0 and the, and the the end, that is the, 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 the number of the last element. And if this number is between 0 and k, we replace the element on the reservoir. And if it's higher than k, we don't do anything. So the nice thing of this is that we'll have that the, all the elements that we see in the stream are going to have the same probability of being inside the reservoir. And this is, uh, can be proved by induction. Another method is the space saving uh, algorithm. So this is a, a method for computing the most frequent elements. So to do that, uh, basically we're going to keep the elements on a counter. And then for all the elements, when they arrive, it's, it's very simple. We keep this reservoir again. And then when a new item arrives, if it's already in the reservoir, we only add one to the counter. But if it's not in the reservoir, what we do is that we remove, we, we replace the element that has the lowest uh, frequency. So it's a very, very simple one, but it's, uh, I think it's uh, the most efficient uh, top K uh, frequent item of uh, minor. And finally, there is this bias random sampling. So the idea here is that what we do is that we replace, uh, yeah, we, we replace the, we add the elements, but we do that with uh, equal probability. So that means that we are going to give more importance to the recent elements than to the previous one. Okay, so in, in the reservoir something we were uh, looking at the probability between 0 and, and n. Here we are going to look at the probability between 0 and, uh, and k. So all the elements, every element that's arrived is going to be replaced inside the, the reservoir. So it's going to have a higher probability than So this is why it's called bias or random sample. So let me show you some charts. So this is using space uh, saving. So yeah, so what we see here is that we do this uh, random sampling. This is uh, uh, we take a sample of uh, uh, 10,000 uh, edges. So here is uh, the, the result. We see here that we have some communities that are really higher. If we do the reservoir sampling, we see much more clearly what are these uh, communities uh, there, that, uh, the ones that have a higher degree. And finally, if we do this bias random something, we see that uh, it's more 
uh, bias to the recent, but then uh, we cannot see uh, as nice as the, the structure of the communities as in the other two, two nodes. Okay, so let me talk about uh, evolving uh, centralities and communities. So, yeah, let's uh, look at uh, temporal networks. So, the idea is that uh, this is something very, very useful yeah, uh, for many types of networks as, uh, to see how influence or disease are spread, personal to personal communication as called, like social networks. So, yeah, we, we have imagined that we have this structure of nodes. So this is, uh, we have this structure of uh, T1. Um, so, at T2, what we have is that. Uh, we have B that is communicating to C and C that is communicating to E. And then in T3, in the time frame, we have that A communicates to B and E communicates to, to F. Okay, so these are the things that are happening over time. What is really important to see is that yeah, we have all of these uh, communications, spreads that have been produced, but this is not equivalent to have all of these uh, communications at the same time. So we cannot say that uh, that this is uh, the same as here because here we have all. So in that case, we can see that we can that A can communicate uh, until F, but we see that it, in temporal this is not possible no? because A communicates to B in time three, but then B, C, E is in time two. So we cannot uh, yeah, summarize uh, in, uh, only one simple network where we have all the communication. So we see that it's really important the edges, so it's very important where is the starting point and the end point of the network. So yeah, so this is why all of these temporal networks we have always what is the starting point and what is the ending point of this uh, split of this uh, communication. So we have we see how over time this is uh, are uh, evolving and these are happening over time. So basically, what we are going to do is that the edges are going to be replaced by uh, edges that are going to contain what is the moment that we start the, the communication and the moment that we finish. Okay, so in that case, we have one, two, one, two. So all of this is going to be replaced by edges. Okay, so this is what we're going to have. We're going to have 17, 19, 7, 9. So this is our really information that we have on the edges that is really different from the static networks. Here we, temporal networks, we need to, to manage this this information for all of these uh, communications. Okay, so yeah, so that, that's the idea. Now, the idea is that uh, this uh, geodesic distance is not limited to the number of hopes that separates the nodes, uh, but it's, uh, we need to also to take into account the temporal ordering of the link. So this is important and this is changes how we need to compute all the measures inside the, the networks. So yeah, this is our example. So what we see is that, for example, we want to go to B to E. Basically, we have uh, different uh, paths, but it should be temporal paths. So it's not only path. It should be temporal paths that we have. So for example, in this case, we can go uh, from B to E. We can go to B, C in time one, and then we can go from C to E in time two. And this is going to take uh, one. Now, a temporal path could be we go to B, D, time 7 and then we go from D to E at time 9 and this is going to take the duration of 2. So we see that there are different temporal paths that we have. The duration is going to be different. So what is more interesting, so in static networks we look at what is the shortest path. So here we are going to look at what is the fastest path. Because what is important for us is that the, the path should be fast, it should be not uh, short. Okay, and then basically when we are computing the centrality measures, we are going to replace the use of the shortest path by the fastest path. Okay, so if we compute the closeness, instead of uh, using the shortest path, what we are going to do is that we are going to, to do the, the duration of the fastest path. Okay, so that's the main idea. And also, for example, with betweenness, instead of uh, looking at uh, what is the percentage of the number of the shortest path that are uh, crosses through this node, we are going to look at the number of fastest paths that uh, crosses through this, this node. Okay, so that's the, the idea that uh, we have. And of course, we see that the, the metrics are going to be really different. So if we compute the fastest path and we should compute the shortest path, we see that the, the measures are, uh, are really different and there is no uh, relation between uh, both. Yeah. 
So it's really different uh, measures and different laws. Okay, uh, to detect how will there are changes on these uh, metrics, uh, one way to, to detect if there are changes on the centrality or the between and centrality, one way is that at each time step we will use that we compute a ranking of the nodes. For example, we are looking at changes on the between and centrality. So what we do is that we do a ranking on the between and uh, centrality. So again, we compute this at uh, instant seven, and we compute that at uh, time fourteen. So we see that the, now the ranking is different. And finally, in, in ranking twenty, so we see that the instances are the ranking is different. And then what we are going to look is at the difference between the rankings that the, the it's applied. Okay. So here, to look what is the centrality change, we are going to look at the difference between the positions of the ranking between uh, different uh, intervals, and then we're going to divide this uh, to the max. And then we're going to say that we have change if this uh, centrality change is uh, higher than a certain threshold that we're going to okay. So this is the way that we deal with this. Okay, and then finally, how to, to track these uh, dynamics of evolving communities. So, yeah, uh, we, we see that most of these uh, Networks, social networks, are networks that are really evolving. So, lots of things happening. Lots, of many communities appear, disappear, merge. So, we need to to look at this and see how we can manage uh, all of these uh, structures. So, yeah, basically, what we, we want to detect communities is not as simple as we have the community and we detect the community and that's all. It's not uh, uh, these communities are going to be changing and they're going to be evolving. So properties of this is that the communities may, may grow or they may reduce, may contract. Two communities can merge or one community can split into two. New communities can, can, can appear and some communities can disappear. So you see many things are going to be happening inside these uh, different communities uh, over time. So yeah, one of the important things is that uh, how we do this uh, mapping between the uh, different uh, communities, between different uh, snapshots. No? So we compute the communities for each one of the snapshots, but then we would like to map so which uh, community corresponds to each community here. So we can see what is the devolution over there. So one proposed solution is to be able to compute to all the pairs of communities between the two uh, timestamps to compute the conditional probabilities. Uh, for so we see what is the probability that a point belongs to this uh, community and also to this community at the same time. And then look at the, at the ones that are higher. So basically, we are going to have this graph. Uh, and then we are going to have a weight that is going to be defined by this probability for each one of the pairs of the two. So we can see what is the, really what is happening inside this community. So yeah, this is an example. So imagine we have these three times. Uh, it's three times uh, stops, so we compute the, the, the communities here in these times, and then we can see that what is happening basically is that if we have these four communities here in this uh, step, this one is going to split, uh, this one is going, is going to reduce, these two are going to be merged. And then here, again, we see that uh, this one still is there, one is going to die, another is going to, to survive, and another one is appearing. So we see that uh, we can put that in this evolution graph where we see what is the evolution of each one of the communities. So what is happening in each one of the, of the time and how they are evolving, merging. Okay. And then the nice thing is that then with this information, we can represent the evolution of these dynamic communities. Then we can have this community life cycle where we have all this temporal sequence of events, the birth, split, the merge, and then we can write uh, like this. No? We can describe this uh, orange, so this one is going to be born, then it's going to split, and then it's going to survive. The trajectory is going to be, so we can write the trajectory as the C is at 3 at T1, at T2 we have C2 and C3, and then at T3 again we have C2 and C3. So this is how we can represent uh, that. So yeah, this is uh, with the telecommunications data, we see uh, how these uh, communities evolve. So you see that how they change the size, they reduce, they increase, how they, they, they merge, 
how so once they they are combined, how so once they disappear. So we can see over time how all these uh, uh, communities uh, evolve. Okay, and then finally, one way to interpret uh, how all of these uh, the dynamics of these communities, how all these evolve. So one way is that. Uh, uh, what we do is that yeah, we compute for each timestamp uh, the, the communities. Then we can uh, create a, a, a matrix where the rows are the different communities. And then the, the attributes are the, the network uh, measures, as uh, minus, uh, degrees, uh, all of these measures. And then uh, we create a tensor because we are going to have uh, one of these matrix for each timestamp. So we have a tensor of three dimensions. And then using this, we can, using this target free model, we can look at what is the core tensor, so how we can, uh, how we can uh, write, express this uh, tensor as a product of this uh, free tensor, where one is going to be the, the core tensor that's going to give a lot of information. From one of these matrices, the B, we have a two-dimensional that we can use to plot uh, trajectories. So yeah, the measures that uh, we're going to be looking are this uh, eigenvector centrality that measures how well uh, a node is connected to, to other well-connected nodes. We have the closeness centrality that is gives us uh, how good is, uh, how fast is a node uh, connected to, other, to the other nodes in the network. And the betweenness centrality is, it, it gives us uh, uh, the extent to which node lies uh, between all the uh, Nodes uh, in the network, all the communications of all the nodes in the network, and uh, yeah, then using this, uh, we can represent this into two-dimensional space, where we can have these dimensions of these uh, B matrix there, and then we have these different measures. We have different. We can express these two uh, dimensions: one is social activity and the social activity and accessibility, and then we can see how these. Uh, at each time stamp, how this is evolving and how this is uh, moving over all these uh, temporal, uh, all these, uh, these two dimensions, how this is evolving over time, how this is changing and, and moving. Okay, so yeah, that was all for this uh, case study.